Okay, so let's just start. Now let's start with the chapter one. Now I have this instrument. Everybody knows that I'm using this to show you the state of stress. Now many of you, as I said, you have learned this idea and everything that we have given in AME 218, but let's put it in perspective here because this is what we need for AME 218. Let's say we have a rod here. Look at these two points. One of them has a blue dot, one of them doesn't. I can go on top, I can go on the side either way, or I can show both of them, doesn't matter. So let's say we have a rod here like that. I go from chapter one to chapter six, all of them. Cover it very briefly. Let's say we have here a P, which is applied to the centroid of this rod. Centroid, because this is supposed to be axially loaded. When we said axially loaded, means the load is at the centroid of this rod, otherwise it will be eccentric. Notice if the load is here, it's not set axially loaded, therefore the item is going to bend. So everything starts from the centroid in chapter one, two, three, four, etc., etc. So therefore, this is the P. Let's look at this point here. And this point, let's call it this point, for example, uh, B, okay. And I'm looking at that point and I want to find the state of stress at that point throughout the book. We are going chapter by chapter to see what happened. First, this is chapter one. It's axially, axially loaded member, and I want to calculate the stress at that point. So what you do, this is the point, no dimension here. It's just showing that little point there. This is a dot here. This is the head of the needle there. But in order to show the direction, we show, show it a little bit larger. So this, this plane is perpendicular to the x. That plane is perpendicular to the y. And here is your element. And we want to find out the state of stress at that point B. This is point B. And depending on the, what type of load we have. First, we have this guy. OK, everybody knows that when I cut this beam into half, so this is chapter 1. So we have P here. We have P here. Of course, you have that point here, either on this side or that side. Notice the point could be on the left or could be on the right. Doesn't make any difference. This is a static. Now, what do we have there inside the body? You, everybody says there is a P. Wrong. There is no P there. there. There is a stress inside the body. Notice it's very important to recognize this. Many people go through ME 218 without this recognition. This is an actual load. There is a hook here. Somebody put a cable and pull it. Is that correct or not? Is there inside also a P? We show the P there, but that's not what's happening here. What's happening here is stress. That's right. So if I show that in a three-dimensional way like that, and the point is sitting here, that's the same point here, what you see inside this body is this. Actually, it is in reverse. I want you to know. Actually, because of this P outside, you have here a sigma uniformly being distributed over the entire area. Is that correct or not? Yes? Correct? Yes, yes. Now, since this is the uniform, and you call the area equal to A, if this area is called A, and as everybody knows from physics classes, if you want to calculate, if you put a pressure, uniform pressure on some area, you put multiply the pressure by the area to get the force, yes or no? Mm -hmm. Correct? So this is the same thing. But instead of pressure, this time is a vacuum. If it was compression, actually it was a pressure, yes or no? So it is a sort of vacuuming uniformly distributed. Actually, sigma <coughs> multiplied by area, but that when I do it together should be equal to what? It should be equal to P. P. So in reverse, actually, this is the sigma. The inside is sigma, so this is what you see. And here you see equal at opposite. I'm sure you have gone through that, and you know what I'm talking about is p. But generally, we don't write it that because we, want, we don't want to show it every time like that. Generally, we go in reverse. We say, as soon as I see a p there, I know this is happening. So what we write, we write sigma equal to p over a. a. That's what we do that. But that's why internally, when I cut something, I do always call it something else. So if this is P, I call this one N. Why I call it N? Because that is normal, normal to the surface. That's right, perpendicular to the surface. But the value of N is equal to P. It is an imaginary force. I usually put a dash line through it. That means it's not in this format. It is in 
this format. Everybody understand what I'm saying there? Yes or no? So it is a stress. It's not there. But since this is very difficult to show, this is what we do. However, what happened to this point now? When we go here, sigma is in which direction? Sigma is in the? That direction. What's that direction? You have to call that one. Let's say this is x and this is y. Is that correct or not? That's how I call it there. Is that correct? Therefore, in this side of element, on the right-hand side of element, sigma is going toward the right. Is that correct or not? Mm -hmm. So when I look at that element on the right-hand side of the element, this is the sigma. Yes or no? Correct? Yes. On the left-hand side, look. This is the left-hand side, but I don't have to do that. I know the two are equal and opposite. But what I'm saying that, be careful. Some of you may choose this one element, in this left equilibrium. Some of you choose this one, but the end result is the same. Is that correct or not? Look what happened here. On this one, you are on the right side of element. On this one, you are on the left side of element. Everybody with me? So therefore, doesn't matter. We know from a static. I can use the left-hand side, or I can use the right-hand side. The stress should be the same. The stress is the same. And the stress at the end, what we put here, sigma x, equal to what? Plus p over a plus because it is in tension form. Yes or no? Yes. Correct? So that was chapter one. And then we went through some other detail, which we just not require at this time, because I just want to cover with you the highlight of what we did there. Then what did we, di did we do in chapter 3? What was chapter 3? Those of you who just taken MB218 recently, what was chapter 3? After we went through temperature change, subdeterminate, indeterminate, Hooke's law, etc., etc., the major part of stress analysis was the shear stresses due to the torsion or torque. Is that correct or not? Now let's look. This is the same. I'm changing now the format of the load. Notice what I'm doing there. I'm changing now. This one is the same B or the same shaft round again, the same point. This time I'm going to put here a counterclockwise torque on the outside here. Obviously, on the other side, I should have a clock equal and opposite. Again, this is what I expect, I expect from you to understand, because these are the type of work we are going to do in this class is this. If I cut it here, you have done it many times yourself. If I cut it here, everybody does that automatically. You set a T here, so look at this T. This torque is going counterclockwise. The internal torque here, we should be going clockwise. On the other side, should be going counterclockwise. So as you see, everything is in equilibrium. Is that correct or not? However, what happens because of this? What is happening inside? Again, this is external torque. I can take this item, put, do this to it. Everybody understand. But is somebody else here doing inside? No, no inside. There is nothing there. What's again inside? Stress. Stresses again. But the stresses are in the form, if I sum it up, it should be equal to this torque. So that gives you the idea where that the stresses should come from and how should they behave. So is this the left-hand side equilibrium, yes or no? So here you have, at the end of that, you have here a torque going like that, external, is the reaction there. So what do you have inside here? That's right. You see, first of all, the torque is going counterclockwise, yes or no? Because I'm looking at this side, not the other side. If it's going like that, this is what you learn. This is what the review is all about. First of all, there are stresses there, and the stresses are in the form of the shear stress. It is in the circular format, yes or no? Remember what you learned there? At the center of the shaft, the stress is zero. As we're going outside, the stress keep increasing. When we go on the outside, the stress is the highest magnitude. Is that correct or not? So that is what you want to understand, that because of this uh, torque that we have there, this torque, then this is what we get. We got tau equal to Tc over J on the outside. This is tau max. We call it tau max. That means that stress will be here, and it is in circular format. Everybody see that? Correct? And if this is my point here, which way does it go now? 
Look, which way does it go? Is it going down or is it going up? On the right side of element, which is this side, everybody is there. The shear stress is going down. That's right. So this is what I want you to do. This is really what I expected from you to do, both in AB 218 and here. Of course, as you see, on the other side will be equal and opposite. So therefore, on the other side will be going up. Is that correct or not? And then, as everybody knows, tau xy equal to tau yx. So I have to go toe to toe and head, I mean, toe to toe or head to head. So as you see, toe to toe, head to head. Is that correct or not? Yes. Now then, I have here a tau. Now, this is the state of a stress combining the previous one to this one. Now you can have all the two of them together. Is that correct or not? Yes. So now, what is the tau? First, look at it. What's this subscript for tau? It is xy or yx, okay, equal to what? Tc over j, is that plus or minus? Everybody is familiar with that. That's what I will ask. If not, I will, I'm going to explain that. You know, some, many people take, take a look at that. They think this is, this is the shear stress. The shear stress in this format you want to put somewhere in your note. If you have a stress element like that, if shear stress goes like this, that is plus. This is tau we are talking about. And if it goes like that, that is minus. And in this class, it's very important to assign sign to your shear. In ME 218, sometimes we let it go because it was not important until we get to chapter 7, which was the shear uh, more circle. But generally, we should assign a sign to that. However, this one is negative, so I'm going to put a minus here. Is that understood? Yes? Yes. Question? All right. This is chapter 3. Now, if the point was here at the distance of rho, of course, that equation changes to what? Tau equal to, that's a T rho over J, just for review. But usually, because the maximum is on the outside, we use this equation more than the other equation. This was the highlight of chapter of course, three, of course, there were a deformation. The deformation was phi. Phi was the angular deformation, et cetera, et cetera. We get to that later on. Is that understood? Mm -hmm. Now, the last part of discussion is this. What has happened if I can put this rod under the bending? Now, what kind of bending do you have? Or what, what? In this class now, I mean, 219 especially, Notice we have this as a bending. Everybody understand that. And this as a bending is that correct? You see, these are the three components of the moment. This moment is about which axis? What's the axis? What is this moment? Is this moment is usually this is x, y, z. By the way, if you have those of you who have I always call this the direction x, y, z, standard one. So this moment is about the z, z. z axis. So if I put here a moment like that, so let's. Erase that. Now, if this is the same right, the same point, nothing has changed except the load has changed. X, Y is the same thing. If I put a bending moment like this, I'm going to create sigma equal to what? Sigma plus minus M Z C over I Z. Is that correct or not? Yes? This is what you learned in chapter 4. This is mz, yes or no? Yes. Now, if I do that, the top point, every top point on the top will be in, guys, on top, compression, on the bottom will be tension. Look at this point, guys. If I'm putting that in tension, which direction is the direction of tension? This is very important. It is going this way. It still is in the direction of x. It still is perpendicular to the cross section. Everybody see what I'm talking about? There is no mystery there. As soon as you say sigma, Sigma must be normal to the cross section. If your cross section here, normal to that is this direction. So it must be x. Is that correct or not? However, if the point is here, look what happened. If I bend it like that, the point on top is compression. The point on bottom is tension. How about this point, which is on the neutral axis? Does it get anything there? No. It, this, so it doesn't get. However, if I bend it about the y-axis, look what happened. Then this side will be in tension. This side will be in compression. Since I choose that point 
on here. So as far as mz, there is nothing there. If there was an my, I put it that, and that's a sigma. I would add or subtract from there. Is that understood? Yes? Did you see how this behaves? So now, from now on, any problem that comes in combination, which we see a lot of that in this class, you can add chapter one and three and four together, which is all you have to do, and you will see that result in the second page of my handout. When you go to the second page, the first, and this handout is just for review as well. You go to the second page, you see for the beam analysis, second page there, you see the beam analysis there, you see the sigma and tau is given there, right? In 3D, that's what I was talking about. Look, look at there, sigma and tau. Notice, if, let's do one more thing. Actually, let's, let me do one more thing, then I will go back again to that one. Next time, if this is the cross section, let's do chapter six as well. This is the same cross section, this is the same point B. This time, let's put there a shear force of magnitude B. What happened there? Which chapter is this, by the way? Shear stresses in its cross section. Now, we studied that twice. One at the air, very early. Now, I'm changing now. I'm going from now to shear forces. So, this was for the bending. I talk about sigma due to the uh, axially loaded member. I talk about tau about the torsion. I briefly talk about M. Here, Mz, C over I, Z, and plus My, C over I. I see that depends where the point is. Some of them could be zero, some of them not zero. Everybody understand what I'm saying? That depends on the location of the point. I cannot do it for this problem. It's difficult unless we go to the actual problem. However, there is another shear stress, and that's the shear stress to you in the beam cross section, which was chapter six. Is that correct or not? Yes? Now, what was the highlight of chapter six? I'm going to put it here. Was this one. Usually, we started with a rectangular cross section. Yes or no? Is that correct or not? Then there was a sh shear force here equal to something, 80 kilonewton, 10 kilonewton, or whatever, or 10 kips, 10,000 pounds. Then we decided that there is a tau average. I put the highlight here. Tau average was equal to force over the area. We saw that in chapter one. Yes or no? That means from top to bottom, the shear stress is uniformly there. This is the shear force. I have to divide that by the area to get a uniform shear stress from top to bottom. Is that correct or not? However, everybody knows from discussion of ME218, that didn't work. Why it didn't work? Because on the top, on this direction, notice when I have a stress going vertically, I must have a stress going horizontally as well because tau xy equal to tau yx. Is that correct? But on the top, there is no stress going in this direction. So there is no reason stress going to be there. So we decided that the stress along that line must be equal to zero. zero. And the same thing here, because the lower part of the beam doesn't have any stress. It's not rubbing against anything. So the stress, so that formula didn't work. So instead of that formula, we end up, we end up with what? Tau equal to plus minus VQ over? IT. So you have to remember that. This was the result of chapter four. That's why I gave you two examples there too. Look at the third line. That's the, this reviewing this material. So I'm giving you all the highlight of what you have to do in all this homework. Everybody understand what I'm saying that. Now, what happened there? So everybody knows what I is. I is the, for this, I is the moment of inertia of this cross section with respect to Neutral axis that passes through the centroid, yes or no? Of course, shear force is shear force. They will give it to you. So many number of pound or newton or kilonewton. Is that correct or not? What's the Q? What's the T? How do we determine the Q? How do we determine the T? That's the question that many people generally forget about that, which we needed for this class. So, so what are those? If I give you the, no, the answer, okay. So if you are interested to find out the shear stress at this level, let's see, we are not on top. We are coming down a little bit at a distance of y here, let's call it there. Q, I don't, I'm not going through the proof of the Q. You make a cut here. The, this area above your cut 
is the Q. You need the Q of that area with respect to neutral axis. Yes or no? And then what's the value of T? OK. So are you OK with me? Yeah. All right. What's the value of T? <laughs> <laughs> Notice, guys, I'm watching you all all the time. Remember, I will, that, I will explain that to you later on. I hope you don't mind. I never let you go off after this class. So if you are in this class, you need to listen to me. And if you listen to me, you probably will learn a little bit here and there. If it is too boring for you, let me know, because I can go much faster if you want, or I can go much slower. But the point is, you need to know this material. I have done this enough to know the significant, although you may be already knowing the answer to some of this question, but please listen because it is important. Therefore, the Q is Q of that area with respect to neutral axis, and the T is the length of the cut or the thickness of the beam in this. That's the T. So that changes from problem to problem. So you put it there. Therefore, you may have here. VQ over IT, which added to that one. Notice these are normal stresses. These are the shear stresses. Now, in this scenario, as you see, if you are this scenario, since it is like that, that's the same problem. Still, the shear stress here is zero. The shear stress here is zero, but the shear stress at the middle, which is the neutral axis, is the, it's not the not correctly, but this is supposed to be half, half circle, half a circle. The stress going downward, therefore, I have to put added to this. Is that correct or not? But they are going in this direction, therefore, it is, is negative. So that's it. So we are covered the whole thing. Is that correct or not? Yes? Now let's do some examples. So this is the idea of a stress element. Now what we do with it and why we do the thing we do in chapter 7, which is the more circle and other idea, that all of them going to be explained on Tuesday class. Everybody understand that. For time being, you should do this sort of thing until we get there. And that. These are the two equations that you should do. So in general, this is plus, minus, plus, minus. Depends on how it works there. Now let's go to problem. I usually, if I have time, I do problem number one and two on the handout. There are class exercises. Go on the next page, or I don't know which page it is. I can tell you. Go to page four. OK, there are four examples there, but I'm going to bypass number one and two and go to number three now for time being, which is similar to what you have there. I'm going to do one example of each one of these, so in order for you to get into the picture. so. Let's do that together. Everybody brings that page up. And I'm going to put the problem on the board for you guys to see. This is the problem that it is a plate. There's a hole here. This is symmetrical, of course, a hole here. And there is a here P and P. Then somewhere here, we have put a gauge. This is a gauge there. And we are measuring the strain at that point. And at that point, the strain is measured. You, everybody knows what the strain is. It measured to be 1,000 micro. What's micro? Micro is 10 to the power of minus 6. So please, when you come up with the strain in your problem, do not come with point 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. That's very. Uh, uh, I mean, that's not readable correctly. You always express your strain in macro. Uh, if, if you go to the lab to do, some of you may already be taking the lab this quarter. Anybody taking the lab this quarter? Yeah, you, see, you see, go to see the machine. The machine always gives the strain in micro. That's the first test you are going to do. Measuring all the strain is micro. This is the unit of the strain. So please write it like that, which is 10 to the power of minus 6. So anyhow. That we measure. Then this distance from here to here is given 30 millimeter. And the cross section here somewhere, the cross section of this plate here, given at, I believe this is 10 millimeter, and this is 50 millimeter. And also E, modulus of elasticity, is given equal 200 G Pascal. G is 10 to the power of 9. That means this material is still, standard still. 
Yes? What's the value of P? That's the question. A couple of your problem, I believe 121 and 124 is in the same format as this one. Is that correct or not? So I, what I'm doing, that I'm not doing a standard eccentric loading. I'm just doing a one that is a little bit mixing the ideas together. Because this is a review after all. How do you calculate the fee? What should I do first? Let's put it this way. What? Cut. You see, every problem starts with that. So don't forget that, guys. You cannot go through the stress without first doing the static or cutting. Is that correct or not? I have to cut this one somewhere. But however, for this problem, does not make any difference whether I cut it here and cut it here or cut it here. That's why I did not give you any particular section. You will see in a minute does not make any effect. Is that correct or not? Yes. So let's go to this point, actually, what, where, what you want to do. You want to go to the section where the, your gauge is because you are measuring the strain gauge at that point. I did not give you any particular location. So be, that means it doesn't make any difference whether you are a little bit to the right or to the left. Is that make sense? That? That is purposely done this way. Then I cannot do any of this. See, I already explained what you have to do. You have to come up with the sigma and tau. But that is irrelevant unless first you do the static of the problem, which means a cut coming with the internal action, the one that is supposed to be a stress. Is that correct or not? Which you show it in the form of a force and a couple. Is that correct or not? What do we have there? Now I can cut it there. I can show the left-hand side, or I can show the right-hand side. Is that correct? Or let's show the left-hand side. So if I go like this, this is the P. Of course, the P is not given. Remember that. We are, the question is, what's the value of the P? OK? What this data instead is given to me. This is the data. If I give you P, this is the whole thing. If I give you P, you go ahead and calculate the stresses. Yes or no? Yes. Correct? This is the reverse. Strain is given because most of the problem in ME219, by the way, is like that. That's why I want to change your, your mindset a little bit. Everybody understand that. We measure the strain. We can never measure the stress. Everybody understand. We do measurement always through the strain. Anyhow, so problem start from a strain. We'll see that in later discussion. Anyhow, now. Do I have a normal force here? The normal force equal to P. Where should I put it? Centroid. Centroid, right. That's right. You do go to the centroid. You put here. This is internal, so I should use a different color. So I use blue this time to show you that is the N. But of course, N equal to put. I put that dashed line to tell you that is stress. Is that correct or not? Yes? M. What's the value of? Is there a, look at this. This is a couple, yes or no? So it is not in equilibrium. Because it's a couple, therefore there is an action here in the form of a couple. The action of this one is going that way, so you have a reaction going like that. That's the value of M. Is that correct or not? I gave this problem in the, in the final, actually to both my classes. It's a bit similar to that, not like that. Many people, they make the mistake. When they were calculating the M, they calculate the M. P times what? They calculate P times point 30. Is that correct? That is a big, big mistake. Everybody understand that. Since the point is not here, because you are ruining the, all the idea here, I just keep stressing to you, everything starts from neutral axis, isn't it? Is that correct or not? So you don't find the here. You do, if I cal calculate what is the value of N, everybody says P. There's no problem. When I ask you what's the value of M, everybody says, or m some people say, 0.03 or 30 millimeter times P. That is incorrect. Everybody understands. Some of you already answered me correctly. Everything should go to the centroid. Remember that. So everything should go to the centroid. But where is the centroid? The centroid is here. Is that because this, this centroid of that is very simple? It is here. So it is 30 millimeter plus twice. So M value actually is equal to 0 0.030 plus 0 0.025 times P. And so therefore equal to 0 0.055 P. Remember, every chapter that we were talking about, that was the key. 
but this was sort of lost among all the other things. Everything starts from neutral axis. Actually, what happened here, look, if I am above the neutral axis, the action of the moment is what? It is tension. If I am below the neutral axis, the action is? How can you take the moment about this point? That's a no-no. That's absolutely, totally wrong. Everybody understand what I'm saying there, correct? The reason we are deciding on tension or compression is because we are above the neutral axis or below the neutral axis. Now, where is our point? Now, our point is here, yes or no? And this is where the gauge sitting here. Now, I already discussed that. What do we have there? You can now, everybody should yes. answer that question. Yes. What is sigma? The sigma equal to what? Sigma equal to no. Let's just start with the state of stress. You see, you need the state of stress for that point. That's what I was talking about. We get to that later on for that. We know there is a, in this section, there is an internal axial force and there is an internal moment. Yes or no? Yes. On t due to the axial force, what do we have? Sigma equal to what? C over, P over A plus. Is that correct or not? Yes, because it is tension. Now, up and down determine whether the next rest of this formula is plus or Minus. If you are on the bottom of the beam, because of M, you have Minus. compression. On the top of the beam, you have tension. tension. Where are we? We are on top. Therefore, I need to put here plus what? <coughs> MC over I. Correct? Mm -hmm. That determines my state of stress, and that determines the epsilon. Is that correct? Now we go to that. Is that correct or not? However, if I was on the bottom, then as or now you appreciate that, that would have been plus P over A minus MC over I. Is that correct or not? Yes. We can't see because of the column right there. OK. So why don't you push back your, your chair or come here or something like that? Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't want to spend time doing it again. Next time I draw it somewhere else. Thank you for letting me know. Can you see it now? <laughs> okay, I do it here. So it's easy to do. Here is, this is what we are talking about. This is the P, and this is the M. Is that correct? So since we are here, therefore due to this, we have P over A due to that one, we have MC over I. Yes or no? Now. OK, what is given now, or what's not given? First of all, look at this cross section. This is our, our cross section. So let's put our now data. I need A, I need I, I need every part to finish this one. Now, everybody knows from previous chapter, every 280 previous uh, work that we have done, that there is a relationship between a stress and strain. We get that to that in a minute. But let's first calculate the area. Of course, the area is, this is the cross section. I put it here one more time. Uh, let's, uh, this is doing like that. So it was 10 and this was 50. Yes or no? So area equal to 10 times 50 equal to 500 millimeter square equal to 500 times 10 to the power of minus 6 meters. <coughs> to notice time 10 to the power of minus 6 because it's meter square. Is that correct or not? Yes? Mm -hmm. Many people, again by mistake, they put here 10 to the power minus 3 for whatever reason. What this is meter square. Anyhow, then you calculate I. I is equal to 112, because this is the neutral axis, remember the center is at the middle. I equal to 112 of base time, height cubic. Everybody can do that, so I, I'm not going to do that, that part of it because it is simple enough. Therefore, <coughs> let's see where is my solution. Where did I put it here? Nope. No, oh, here it is. OK. <clears throat> there, I become equal to, point one o four times 10 to the power of minus 6 meter to the power of 4. So I'm expressing everything in the meter. And of course, C in your equation is half a 50 millimeter or 25 millimeter or 0.25 meter. So as you see, C A, A given, this is P and this is point of 0.55 P. So everything now, I have two unknown, P and sigma. So 
I'm looking for P. So somehow I have to get through my information that I have from the strength of material one. I should be able to calculate sigma. What's the sigma equal? What? So I want you to remember this. This is, again, a very, very important that we are going to make a reference to this curve many, many times in this class. Remember that sigma versus epsilon, which we call it Hooke's law. Remember all that you spend about a week discussing that in every ME2 class. That goes first straight, then goes like that, then goes like that. Everybody understand that? The slope of this line is modulus of elasticity. This is the equation we are going to use extensively in this course. In this, with, through this Hooke's law, we end up to be epsilon to be equal to sigma over modulus of elasticity. So we use that a lot in this class. So that's the one, that's our purpose to pick up this problem because we have to use that in this equation, in, the, in this scenario. Is that correct or not? Now, to make this a little bit more for you to review that, then we have another curve similar for that for tau versus what? Tau versus gamma. What's the gamma? The shear strain, which is the angular deformation. Everybody understand. Epsilon is change in the length. Gamma is angular deformation because shear stress causes angular deformation. But this time when we get the slope, this time the slope is not modulus of elasticity. This time it is modulus of rigidity. That's right. So the same ratio works. So here you write gamma equal to tau divided by, this is another equation for reminder. Of course, we are not there in this problem. We don't need it. But i just refresh your memory of some of the things that you must learn in ME 218. Is that correct or not? Yes? Yeah. However, for this problem, we need only the first one. So here, well, I'm saying that since, sigma, since epsilon equal to sigma over E, therefore sigma must be equal to, sorry, sigma must be equal to E times epsilon, what's the value of E is 200 times 10 to the power of 9 Pascal, which is Newton per meter square. Is that correct or not? Yes. Multiplied by epsilon. <coughs> epsilon was how much? 1,000 times 10 to the power of negative 6. You simplify that. That becomes equal to 200 mega Pascal. Because epsilon was given to me. Epsilon was given the type of material. That's exactly what you do in the lab. Some of you take your great lab. They are going to give you a piece of metal. They color it. You don't know whether it's aluminum or it's steel or that. They ask you to measure the epsilon through the test. And they tell, tell their guy whether this is a steel or this dependent. You go to the table. You find out much less of elasticity. Or you do the testing on the shear stress or finding the G, et cetera, et cetera. Those are some of the testing will be done in the lab. Is that correct or not? Anyhow, so what I'm saying that now you put in this one, that's all we have to do. So the final phase of the problem is putting the two and two together. Notice what was important here is this two and the state of stress at that point. Everybody understand that because that's the state of stress. That is the internal forces, which was two action now here. So finally, all you have to do now, all you have to do here, sigma, which is 200 times 10 to the power of 6 Pascal or Newton per meter square, equal to P divided by area. The area is 500 times 10 to the power of minus 3 plus M. M is 0.055P times C. C was 0 0.025 divided by I. <coughs> I is... 0.104 times 10 to the power of minus 6. Keep these two for your mega, because when they go to the numerator, it becomes plus, so it becomes your mega. Do the rest of the analysis. Cal calculate for P. Anyhow, P ends up to be equal to, <coughs> for this problem, become 30, <coughs> or 13. 1,158 Newton, so you can write it equal to 13.2 kilonewton. Roughly, you are using three-digit accuracy. <coughs> For that amount of the P applied to here, you get that reading there. You increase the P, of course, that changes. Is that correct or not? Did you see what happened there? 
So we cover lots of things. Now let's go quickly to problem number five. I don't have time to do that in totality, but I give you the highlight of problem, no, sorry, problem number four. Problem number three was this one. Problem number four on the same page, notice I give you another state of stress. There is a reason I'm doing that because that one gives you some information about this type of problem. So I'm covering practically everything that you learn through this example in ME 218, a highlight of stresses. Now look what we have there. This is the scenario there. So please write it down. There is a beam there or a cantilever beam like that. There is a force of 80 kilonewton at this end, somewhere at a distance of 102 millimeter. At the point here, which is 16 millimeter, this is 1 6, 16 millimeter below the neutral axis. You want to find the state of stress for this problem, knowing the following. The cross section of the beam is, which I'm showing here a little bit larger, the cross section of the beam is 18, 18 millimeter by 80 millimeter. And this is where the point is. The centroid, of course, is at the middle, and there is where your point is. So if I call this one point A, your point A is here. Again, exactly what you asked me last time. If I want to find the state of stress at that point, the first thing is to determining the internal forces, okay? So I have to make a cut. Notice I do not need even to do the reaction here. All I have to do is do it this way. You see this, you go like this. Sorry for picture, I'm rushing it so the picture doesn't come out good, but you understand what I'm talking about. Again, this, where is the centroid? The centroid is at the middle of 40 and 40, yes or no, because it's rectangular shape, yes or no? Therefore, what do we have here? Do I have axial force? No, there is no P over A. Actually, look what happened here. In ME2, one person in particular, I remember, I put here a P in one of the problem, and if you end up here saying sigma equal to P over A because you see that P, that means you haven't learned anything from ME218. Is that correct or not? P over A is only when force is along the, this way. Is that correct or not? This force P causes this to bend downward. Is that correct or not? See, obvious. But as I said, occasionally, very occasionally, people make a mistake there. So do I have a shear force down there? There is a force here, there is a shear force there. Do I have a bending moment there? Of course, I'm going faster. Again, the action is here, the reaction is there. Is that correct or not? Where is my point? This is the centroid, my point is here. This is my point A. Is that correct or not? A little bit below it. So this is where you are. You can show it as a little square again. Now, how does little square looks like that? This is what it's going to look like. I gave it to you in the handout. In the handout, it is there, but let's, let's, let's look at it. Let's go through the shear. If I want to go through the shear, this shear force is going upward, therefore the shear stress must be going upward. Where? On the left of element. Is that correct or not? So where are we? We are on the, this side. Yes or no? Everybody with me? Okay, so if this happened to be again x and y, so you define your axis first. Sometimes they are not in x and y. If you are here, x and y, that one will be y and z, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody understand that. I just use that for just explanation. Then I have a shear stress. I show the stresses in color. So I have a shear stress going upward like that, yes? So on the other side, it will be coming down, then toe to toe, head to head. So again, here, I have a sigma x, and I have a tau xy, exactly like previous problem. The very standard there. Now let's see what we get from tau xy. Tau xy is minus vq over it, yes or no? Yes, for which point? For point A. So we have to determine the value of that. Now, as far as the, is there a normal stress there? Yes or no? Look at this moment. This moment, it's tell on top is 
tension on the bottom is compression, and it is linear. Remember that? So this was the idea was presented to you. Let's put it this way. This is the tension. This is the compression, yes or no? On the neutral axis is yeah. <coughs> zero, and between those two are linear. Where are you? You are here, somewhere below the neutral axis. Is that because therefore you are in compression? So you have stress going like that in the direction. Of it. And that is <coughs> negative m not c over i, y over i, because you are not on top and you are not on the bottom. Yes or no? Yes. Good. So let's, again, like last time, I don't need the area. All I need the I. So you calculate the I of this cross section. So this is the rest of the data. I'm going very quickly over that. The I become equal to um, for this problem, which is problem number oh, uh, No, I'm just looking for that one. Yeah, yeah. So I become, did you already calculate that? Yeah, 0. 0.768 times 10 to the power of minus 6 meter to the power of, that's the value of I. The value of M, let's calculate the M. The value of M is 80 times 102, is that guy? So 80 times 10 to the power of 3 Newton times 0. 0.102 meter. So it becomes 8,160 Newton meter, the value of I here. The, the value of Y, of course, is equal to 16 millimeter between linear neutral axis. You don't have to worry about the sign. So therefore, it becomes equal to 0 0.016 millimeter. So all of that given, you calculate all of that, end up to be 170 megapascal. You see it in the picture there. When you put all those numbers together, it become 170 mega Pascal. Is that correct or not? Calculating the tau was my, my major concern here, because now we go to the tau. Notice the shear force is 80 kilonewton. Yes or no? Correct? Because the shear force is 80 kilonewton. And then I have the I. I need the Q and I need the T. Is that correct or not? What Q and what T? You already answered me previously. So I have to cut it here, yes or no? But don't come from top, because the Q of above and Q of the below are equal and opposite. So you go, you need only this Q. Is that correct or not? Yes? Q of that area, so I'm going to calculate Q here. Q for that point A is equal to this area, which represents the mass, which this distance was 18, this distance is 16, and this distance is 40. So what is left here is 24, yes or no? So it is 18 times 24. So from here to here is 24. So the area is 18, 24, multiplied by y bar. Is that correct? Everybody knows that q is equal to a y bar. Is that correct or not? What y bar are we talking about? Where is the mass center? You put this mass here, yes, at the center of this rectangular shape, and this is your y. Is that correct? Which is 16 plus 12, so that's 28. So this is 28. So you put all. Where is the T? The T is equal to 18 millimeter, yes or no? So you put all those numbers together, and the answer for that one is also minus 70 megapascal. Notice when I use this 102 because I wanted to get this round number. And you see those answers in your, in your handout. Everybody see that? OK. Now, one more problem I want to quickly go over. So, and that is problem number one on the homework assignment. So please go to problem number one, because your problem is two and three. To do two and three, I want to give you a little highlight of the shear and moment diagram. Of course, we are going to spend a lot of time here with shear and moment diagram in this class with determinate problem, indeterminate problem. Lots of other ideas is going to be there. So let me quickly. Everybody should bring that problem up. Problem number one in the homework assignment one. Homework assignment two is for next week.
So please, I gave you the handout for week and a half, so it's because no, I will. No, it go to the homework assignment oh. one, the last page, the last, the page before the last. There is three beam there. Homework assignment one, don't make a mistake there, yeah. Oh. Homework assignment page, which is the pages before the last page, yes. And there are three problems there. Number two and three are your homework, remember that. Number one, I'm going to do that. So this is the problem you will see there. So please write it down. There is a roller here. There is a pin there. You have divide that into here like that. This is point A, point B, point C, point D. And the distances are 5 feet, 5 feet, and 10 feet. Then at point B, you have, I believe, 1,500. Is it 1,500 load? Yes. yes? Yeah, 1,500 pound load. Then you have a moment of 1,000 1, pound foot. Be careful about the unit. And then here, you have a uniform distributed load of 250 pound per foot. And we want to draw the shear and moment diagram quickly. Notice I'm about a few minutes behind, but I so hopefully I will manage the whole thing for you guys. Is that correct or not? Yes? Yes. All right. Of course, the first thing to find the reaction here and there. That should be no problem for any of you. Is that correct or not? Yes. You take the moment about A or B, so that I'm going to put it here. 1,800 pounds here. And 2,200 pounds there. That will be the reaction, step one. Step two, shear diagram. Shear diagram usually is very simple for you guys, but let's go over that just quickly. So here we go. So what you do, you go with the x-axis here, shear in, the, in pound. So you put your unit there. So you put all your point there, A, B, C, and Okay? Now, what's the value of the shear at point A? 1,800. Plus or minus? Plus. Plus. Everybody knows that. Know that. Okay, good. Why? Because you are talking about this. I'm going to say it anyway. So if the format is like that, if the deformation is like that, the right-hand side is going down, the left-hand side going up, that is plus. Everybody understand that. If the deformation is like this, means the right-hand side is going up and the left-hand side going down. Now, get me this. It's very important. Statically, this is negative. This is positive. Statically, this is positive. This is that. This format gives me the shear and moment diagram the way up. Because the shear and moment diagram is all about the deformation of the beam. The deformation of the beam comes in a week or two, and we are going to spend about two, three weeks on that those deformation in this class. Now, here it is. Of course, since this is going up, the shear is going down, so it will be this format there. Obviously, it is 1,800 plus, absolutely. Yes or no? Yes. Then we go, nothing happened up till an epsilon before B. Is that correct or not? So we go straight. Then you don't go to B, you pass the B. Is that correct? After you go past the B, suddenly 1,500 pounds appear there, yes? Mm -hmm. 1,500 is going down, the shear is going? Up. Is it plus or minus? Look at my hand. It is minus. Then I should be going down. Therefore, suddenly I drop this to 1,500, so I end up to how much? I end up to 300. Then nothing happening until point C. After point C, I have again to subtract. But what do I subtract? Is the linear? Is that correct? The slope of that will be 250. Pound per foot. Is that correct or not? So it means that from here, which is 300, the total of this area is 2,500. I'm at plus 300. I should end up to minus 2,200. Then I add that to it. So therefore, I go back to zero. That is your shear diagram. Many people do that correctly. You don't have any problem. But when it comes to the moment, more or less, some people have a little problem there. It shouldn't be, because it's the same idea. If you so nicely did your shear diagram, why not do the 
no. moment diagram, but consider this system. Consider the sign convention like here. I'm going to put the sign convention down. If you have a piece of beam behaving like that, which as you know I call it a smiley face, is that correct or not? Yes? This is positive. positive. Again, remember that. Statically this is negative. Statically this is positive. positive. But this format is plus the frowny face, which means it gets this kind of action. This is plus, this is minus. Everybody understand that. That is a negative deformation. So both of, based on that, we are going to go forward now. Here, again, you go to x, and here you go to m. m is in pound foot. Don't forget that. Some people make a mistake that because pound foot, pound inch makes a difference when you design the beam. So you are starting here at zero. Yes or no? Now, you have two options there, two, two three options there. First, I have to either from he, then on, the shear is constant, the moment must be linear, yes or no? The only question is up or down. Obviously, it is up because this is plus. So therefore, I have to go up to point B. So this is point B, this is point A. How far up should I go? You can go to the area, you can cut it here, you can do anything. But one thing I didn't ask you to do or don't want you to do is write the equation and use the equation. Everybody understand that. You can cut it here, use equilibrium, or use the area method, which is much simpler. This area equal to how much? This area equal to, as you see, 1,800 times 5. So that is plus 9,000. So I have to go from 0 to plus 9,000. That's no problem. But what do I do after that? Do I go down or do I go up? Subtract. Everybody, up or down? down? You see, I hear some people not saying that. Up or down, it's very important. Down, correct. Now, look what happened here. This moment, statically, is positive. No, statically, this is positive. There's no doubt about it. It's going to go counterclockwise. It's positive. That we didn't change. What you should look at is not that. What do I look at? Look at it. This is positive. After that point, the beam behaved like that. Is that correct? To balance that, this is the system. Yes or no? The right-hand side, look, after that, you are here. This is going this way. So in other words, this is that way. The beam should be behaving like that to make it in equilibrium. Therefore, it's not a positive mode. It is a negative mode. So I should be going down. So how much down? 1,000, so this is 8,000. Is that correct or not? Don't make that mistake. You look at this format or this format. If it was like that, actually it's in reverse, as you see it. Everybody got that point? All right, good. Because that's the only point. Then from then on, I should add again how much? This area, that area is 300 times 5, which is 1,500. I should be going up. This is point C, so I should be going up to 9,500. Yes or no? Look how simple this is being done easily. It's being done with the same idea of, of course, of free body, I mean, of the sign convention. Is that correct or not? After that, what happened? Notice this is plus, this is a little plus, then suddenly become yeah. minus. So I must be from this point C, I must be going a little bit up, right? And then I must go to point D, which is zero, because that's a pin as well. Is that correct? Where is that point and how much that is? Give me one more minute. So I can use this idea of similar triangle. This is 300, and that is 2,200. This length is 10. It's very easy to find out. This becomes one point two. Is that correct or not? Yes? yes. Then what's this area now? No, this area was 1,500 plus. That little area is 300 times. 1.2 by divided by 2, 360 divided by 2, so it is 180. So I have to go another 80 down, 9,680, and that's it. that is your moment diagram. This is the very important point. Some of you guys in the final, you missed that. I don't know whatever reason. When shear equal to zero, moment either is maximum or is Minimum, in this case, in this beam, actually, what's the maximum amount of moment? 9,680. What's maximum amount of shear is? 
2200, that is here, that's there. The next time you are going to design this beam. Everybody understand that? So we have done some of the design. So you are all good for your